Dan Scanlon, the director and co-writer, in some ways this is a bit of an autobiographical piece because Ooh, okay. he used I'm to be. I'm leaning in. He used to be an elf. No, I don't mean. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm James Carey, and this is Popcorn Parenting, the conversation with your kids about Disney, DreamWorks, and Doctrine. I'm joined, as ever, by my friend, reformed mythologist, former children and youth minister, father of two, Nate Morgan Locke. Hello, Nate. Hi, James. How are we doing? I'm good, thanks. And today we are talking about... Tell us the title. Onward. 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 That's right. Today's word is onward. So we start off with the cold hard facts. Cold hard facts. Bang up to the minute um, film. It is 2020 American computer animated urban fantasy produced by Pixar. The film is directed by Dan Scanlon, who directed Monsters University or Monster University. Screenplay by Scanlon, Headley and Boonin. And it stars the voice of Tom Holland who is obviously a megastar, so famous that I haven't seen any of his films. But, all I, but what I do know is uh, he is the son of a British comedian called Dominic Holland, who for a while had a very funny blog about how the fact that his son was very quickly going to be much more famous than him. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it also stars the voice of Chris Pratt, of course, of Parks and Rec and the Lego movies, of Julia Lois Dreyfus, star of Seinfeld and Veep. And Octavia Spencer, who's got a bewildering stack of TV and movie credits, if you look her up. It was released on March the 6th, which is not that long ago, 2020. The running time is 103 minutes. It cost about $200 million to make, and the box office is $104 million. And I suspect that is where that box office figure will stay, because Mm. uh, the coronavirus has hit. But at the time of recording, the movie is available in the US on Disney+. Plus. Those are the cold, hard facts. Give us in a world. In a world inhabited by mythical creatures, magic was once commonplace, though difficult to master. After technological advances over the years, magic became obsolete and was largely discarded. Dot, dot, dot. That is straight off Wikipedia. But interestingly, you didn't actually mention the inner world that I was going to say. I was going to say, okay. it's two L. Do the voice. Do okay, the voice. sorry. In a world where magic has been forgotten, two elvish brothers get their dad back for a day. That's the sort of basic premise. In terms of the cold hard fact, we should also mention that Dan Scanlon, the director and co-writer, in some ways this is a bit of an autobiographical piece. Because Ooh, okay. he used I'm to leaning be, in. He used to be an elf. No, I don't mean <laughs> <laughs> he he his father died when he was two, I think. Two uh, one or two, but very, very young. And the, the central premise of the film is that these two brothers and their mom, uh, JLD, their dad died when they were very, very young. And so the premise of the film is really for them to go and find out who he was and and to sort of meet him through the sort of world of magic and this quest and some Phoenix stone sort of thing. So it's really interesting watching the film with that perspective to say there's, you know, really it's about yearning and it's about that sort of typical yearning, which is there for all parents and all children thinking about the mortality of their loved ones. But this is for a guy who literally experienced seeing photographs of himself with his dad, but having really no recollection of him at all. And I found that sort of quite telling. So so the basic basic premise is these brothers go on this quest uh, because their dad has left them this this magic spell that they can do where he can come back for 24 hours. And so it doesn't sort of quite go to plan as, as you would expect with this um, at the beginning. And so we have to get all the way through as they race against the clock, against the sun going down in order to be able to spend some time with dad. 
Now, I was thinking about this. It reminded me. Do you know? Do you know the Luther Vandross song "Dance with My Father"? Do you know that one? Bless, bless you for thinking <laughs> that I might. <laughs> so there's a Luther Vandross song called "Dance with My Father," and it's basically how, what he would give to be able to dance with his dad again. So apparently when he was right. a child, his dad used to pick him up and dance him around the living room and his mother would join in and all this sort of stuff. And so he sort of tells his story, which is incredibly <laughs> sentimental, incredibly emotional, about how much he would give just to have one more moment with them. And the, again, same idea is in, we'll go from Van Dross to Costner, Field of Dreams. Right, okay. So Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. And what is it that he wants to get at the end of it? He wants to get one more catch with his dad. So he wants to, you know, his dad comes back and, you know, is this heaven? This is Iowa. Um, which Iowans are very proud of that line, by the way. If you go to Iowa, that's all it okay. sort of says everywhere. Yeah. And Kevin Costner says, this is heaven. That's good enough for me. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't matter that Jesus does not say that. <laughs> no, yeah. Costner does. Costner does, therefore yeah. we'll go with him. So I don't know if you've experienced this with your own parenting or your own parents, but I have a very strong sense of yearning, even in the very moment of which I'm enjoying precious moments with my children. So... Yeah. I'll be doing something. I'll be going, this is so brilliant. I wish I could hold on to this and have this to be the thing that I do and for this to be my eternal experience. So I remember with my daughter, it was a, we were messing about on the beach one day and she just kept wanting to do the same thing over and over again. And I thought, if I abandon myself to play this game, sort of let myself just enjoy this silly moment messing about with wet sand, this would be bl eternal bliss, right? Surely wouldn't this be bliss? And then with this lockdown, one of the things that we've been doing, we've been playing catch. So he's part of a little league team. And let's, I'll be honest, he's not a natural sportsman. But we've been able to go outside with the the baseball mitts and, and a ball and just do 100 catches sort of thing and, and throw it back and forth. You do a checkpoint at 10. So if you get to 10, then if you drop it, you start again from the previous 10. And I'll admit to actually dropping the ball on purpose to extending that, you know, opportunity to, to play it. So I think it, this is where Pixar are absolutely brilliant because they've, they've drilled into the sort of the, the yearning of parent-child parent relationships. Yeah. And th there's that they moment where that. you just want it, yeah, and you want it to last forever. And yeah. the two the two examples I can think of was I remember, I'm in the mid, I'm in between two memories here, in that when my first uh, was uh, quite very small, I remember dancing with her in our kitchen when we lived in London. Mm. I don't remember much about it other than the fact that I remember dancing with her, you know, and she was in my arms because she was one or two or three mm. or something, and thinking. And I'm all I'm I'm gonna to start to cry in a minute if I'm not careful. This I'm is thinking, a, gonna be a teary episode, yeah, I think. And I'm thinking okay. in about 20, 23, 28 years time, I'm gonna be dancing with you on your wedding day. Mm. And you're gonna be somebody else's. And boy. It's too yeah, much. It's too much. It's too isn't much. It? And then there was the other one was even when even when my oldest was a tiny little baby, there was an advert for a Volkswagen polo, which came on the TV. <laughs> okay. And it just and it and it goes from Parents coming back from hospital with baby. Right, yeah. Flash forward to toddler, flash forward to first steps, flash forward to this, 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 yeah. you know. And basically she grows up in 30 seconds on the TV, mm -hmm. for maybe mm -hmm. a minute. I'll put a link mm -hmm. to it in the show notes. And at the end of it, she's about to go to university and she opens the door and there's a Volkswagen Polo there mm -hmm. advertising the Polo. But it basically, I just—it was like watching your daughter grow up in mm. in sixty seconds. Yeah. I was not pre I was not prepared for that. Yeah. And there yeah. I was, literally holding a little girl in my arms. Yeah, yeah. And, and watching that advert, and it was, and I—I I think I started to cry. Mm. But and that's um, that's why I think they get so brilliant. Pixar's sort of Pixar's emotional intelligence is just off the scale, right? They yeah, yeah, they yeah. tap into this, and this is by no means one of the best Pixar films. But, you know, just a, um, this isn't a review show in, in that sense. Yeah. But 
But it, th- there's all sorts of bits where you just go, oh, okay, well, you know, I, DreamWorks could have done that fairly easily. I, it, there's nothing obviously Pixar yeah. about it. Um, but what they've, they, so they've tapped into that emotional uh, resonance. And it's quite, it, this is fully on the nose, right? You've got a boy um, listening to a, a cassette recording of his dad on the telephone. Right, so it just happens to I don't know, yeah. no reason given for it. So what the boy then does is to speak to the recording as though he were having the conversation with his dad, because his dad wow. says a bunch of just very sort of generic phone things. Hey, how you doing? Oh, okay, good to hear that. You know that sort of thing. So you just like and this is right at the beginning of the film. So you're a bit, wow. so you're just sort of going, oh my goodness. And I'm knowing this yeah, sort of... Yeah, thinking to yourself, <laughs> wow, this isn't even a metaphor. <laughs> this is, no, it's not. This is the thing. This yeah. is the thing. It just happens to be on a screen. So it really is about this sort of yearning for relational eternity, I think, that it's it's difficult to experience other than through your relationship with your parents or your children. And for some of us who are incredibly blessed to have strong, good relationships, you know, both up and down the generations, that's the heart of this film. The film is really about what would it be like to have 24 hours back with dad? And what would you want to do in that time? And that's a very different question from, let's say you only had 24 hours left to live, what would you do? Yeah. It's a totally different question. Or even if if you had three wishes, what would you wish for? Yeah, exactly. So, so there's there's something that's very powerful about it. But as as it's about yearning, so it's about this this desire that we have for something slightly out of reach, and even when it is in our reach, it feels sort of incomplete. And there's something about it being an American version of fantasy, which also makes it nat- intrinsically funny, because right. accents matter. But if you've got an American accent and you're talking about centaurs and mermaids and balrogs yeah. and other stuff, it sounds sort of silly. Yeah. And there's something about the the casting of fantastical films, which means you're only allowed to put certain people with certain accents in, in certain roles. So if you watch Lord of the Rings, it's quite funny to realise that all the orcs are cockneys. Right, and all the yeah. obviously all the Shire is full of um, you know just sort of people from the the West Country or, or whatever it is. Yeah, and well, then, it's sort of it's sort of Birmingham in some ways. Yeah, yeah, Black Country yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, but you've got that idea that the accent communicates something very strong, and because America really doesn't have any any way to hold on to the things of fantasy and the things that are of, of folklore. Yeah. It feels kind of funny. They have these sort of things called uh, Renaissance fairs, Renaissance fairs, as they just yeah. call them. And this is kind of just a big play on that joke, yeah. um, really, for the film. Is that when everyone, the, uh, that when all the Americans do their, hey, English voices, that's right, I'm English. And <laughs> that's I'd, it. Verily, I sort of speak Shakespearean English, and they sound like yeah. you know, Nigel Tufnell from and, uh, Spinal yeah, Tap it's, at it, best. It's been interesting. Since being here, I've discovered uh, the world of microaggressions because on a daily basis, someone will come up to me and go, Oh, hello, have a cup of tea. Do you like some more beef, Wellington? Oh, and you just sort of... And now I feel sorry for all the people from Northern Ireland that I knew when I lived in London. And everyone just does their voice all the time. How are you? How are you? From Bain, yeah. Bain, Bain, a parashar. That's right. Yeah, a point, a point yeah. on the grind. Yeah. Um, so it's that sort of thing. Where, so this is your belated apology. <laughs> this is a big apology. Although, although if I'm honest, I do think accents are fair game. They're fun, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah That's yeah. the joy of life. The joie de vie yeah. is the uh, the fact that we. Can is there any? It. Sorry, we're just getting we're getting sidetracked a little bit. Okay. I want to keep us back on I, track. It, it did make me think, okay, we're just going to get a series of jokes about what would a normal American suburban life look like with fantasy elements. Yeah. And and there is a sense in which the the they want to tell you that we need to return to the magic, right? There's something we've lost because all of this... We do live in a fantasy world, which I think is, mm. is 
Uh, N.D. Wilson's actually very good on that, the guy who wrote the 100 Cupboards books. Hmm. Um, he's very good on the fact that you already live in a fantasy world. So if I told you that you could take dinosaurs, crush them down over, you know, whatever you believe, however many years, yeah. and then turn that into a liquid to make explosions to run your car. Yeah, yeah. And to fly things through the sky, you'd be like, wow, that's pretty yeah. impressive. And it's this idea of a kind of uh, a, a nostalgic feeling, a desire to return to to something that you've been dislocated from. Homesickness, in a way, I suppose, is the closest we get. But I think that's very powerful. And it, it's, it's, it is something that I think is very well expressed in, in fairy story and in fantasy and obviously, you know, Lewis mm. and Tolkien are sort of experts at that sort of thing. I just wanted to mention a couple of books in terms of what this, in my view, I think is about. So uh, there's this one, which is Bruno Bettelheim, The Uses of Enchantment, The Meaning and Importance of Fairy Tales. So his perspective is essentially that the reason fairy tales exist and fables and myths, etc., is for psychotherapy. So okay. it's bought. It's basically bought into this this Joseph Campbell hero with a thousand faces, comparative mythology and psychoanalysis. That the reason we have these stories is for our self actualization, so that we become who we were meant to be. It's just this process of becoming who you are in that that way. And I think that's the overriding model or perspective for people writing in Hollywood at the moment. That's the only real model. The reason we have these stories is so that you can become who you are supposed to be and and leave and you know your childhood behind and grow into adulthood. And and part of that is going to be dealing with your parents' mortality. And so in a sense you could say Onward is about, you know, a coming of age film for Ian the Elf to come to be, you know, not a boy elf, but a, a man elf, if that's even a phrase. A grown-up elf. And so, I mean, we'll come to this book a lot more on other things. So when we do Tangled, this will be the real one to go to. Bruno Bettelheim. And it, it also, Nate's read this book, folks, so you don't have to, but you might be wanting to do some further reading. Uh, so C.S. Lewis's article, Sometimes Fairy Stories Say Best What's to Be Said, which he right. wrote, for the New York Times back in 1958. Right. And that's where he outlines this stealing past the watchful dragons idea. Right. And it's very succinct. It's a very short little essay. And it will just, I think everyone should read it uh, who's a Christian interested in the art. So we should definitely put a link to that. But because this is onward and because they are indebted more to Tolkien, this is yeah. the one you should get which is Tolkien's essay on fairy stories, which is considerably longer than, um, than Lewis's. Of course it is. It's by Tolkien. Thing. I know. Tolkien just... Yeah, yeah I, had to give, I had to give up reading Fellowship of the Ring to my kids. There you go. This is right. The Council um, of Elrond, Mr. Oh Tolkien. Oh, my goodness. The Council Ents, of Elrond. Ents just going on for hours. But what, what he does brilliantly is to show you something he calls the eucatastrophe, which, as you've pointed out to me before, is spelt E-U catastrophe. So, so it's and it's, a, it's, not a, it's not a leave slogan. <laughs> it's not. It's not a no Nigel means. Farage uh, subtext. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah, so this is one of the things he says towards the end of his fairy stories. It is a mark of a good fairy story of the higher or more complete kind that however wild its events, however fantastic or terrible the adventures... It can give to a child or man that hears it, when the turn comes, a catch of the breath, a beat and lifting of the heart, near to and indeed accompanied by tears, as keen as that given by any form of literary art and having a peculiar quality. And then he says, in such stories, when the sudden turn comes, the eucatastrophe, we get a piercing glimpse of joy and heart's desire that for a moment passes outside the frame, rends indeed the very web of story and lets a gleam come through. So he's sort of, he's saying that fantasy, fairy story 
in a way, is an access point to our true sort of emotional life, our connectedness to something greater and higher than we might otherwise think, is incredibly efficient. It's an incredibly quick way to do that, if it's obviously a well-written story. Yeah. And that that was proof for me. I mean, we've nearly been in tears just talking about our own our own children. Yeah. I literally was in tears, just streaming down my face at the end of um, at the end of Onward. But no spoilers until no spoilers, we've given not yet. Yeah. the spoiler alert. So again, links to Tolkien and stuff in the show notes. Uh, do you want to just go? Just give us a bit of Bible before we spoil it. So the bit of Bible I would say generally is here, here's how you need to change your perspective. Onward is a story of two brothers going on a quest, facing all sorts of dangers in order to find out about their dad. Yeah. So they have to do all the work. It's their journey. They are the hero of the story. To discover something they didn't know. Whereas the fundamental difference between the gospel and that is, in the gospel, it's God revealing himself to us. Right. We're not on some, you know, noble quest to find out the truth about God. We're actually running away from him and at various times because of our sinful nature, hiding from him. Yeah. But it is God's nature to reveal himself both in natural and special yeah. revelation and fully in Christ who comes as the light. Yeah. So the, the light of God's revelation is dynamic. It moves and it moves towards us who are in the darkness Whereas the typical fairy story, the typical hero, yeah. if we take ourselves, is always the one having to climb up to the top. Yes. And whereas... It's always there. It, to, in story terms, it always yeah. has to be their decision. Because yeah. as a story writer myself and a sitcom writer, you can't just hand your hero the solution on a plate. No. In no. a way that theologically, as reformed evangelicals, we would say, well... You, yeah. you are. <laughs> yeah, having, yeah. having said that, I, 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 my only, not pushback would be, but would just to say, it is always interesting to me how in his earthly ministry, Jesus was really interested in people leaning in. And so mm. he, would, he would tell parables that were deliberately confusing. Mm. It, and it, and he, he, wasn't, he never ran after anybody. Uh, mm. That he always said, come, come to me sit down and I will tell you but yeah. that and the disciples were on that and we see so I think the life of discipleship is to some extent that journey but that is not the yeah. that is not our journey of conversion really in that sort of way yeah. as we would understand yeah. it is that fair helpful I think so I think so I, I suppose the primary thing is if God is not sort of waiting to be discovered yeah in one sense his action is to condescend to us yeah in love yeah. in is his word yeah. he speaks out to us through but, the church really but it sounds yeah, to me like the dad has already condescended to make himself known yes he sort of has and he's given them a um a sort of a little a way in yeah. i suppose i yeah, suppose yeah. you could, yeah yeah we, we can without, say that without but wishing I, to go all gnostic and divine sparks and all that kind of stuff yes it, yeah, yeah. in a way we sort of it is a bit of a both and isn't it even though yeah. we are you know cut us and we and it says like rock predestination through our limbs um <laughs> yeah. it, there there is an extent of, of of a way in which that we we investigate we explore we, we mature in the faith we are sanctified yes. even though it is all by grace through yes. faith i don't know I'm, i feel like i'm getting on thinner and thinner ice here <laughs> i can see you <laughs> the, backing away slightly the, the other the thing with co-host suddenly burst into flames the other thing with onward is that um you're basically given, uh, well, uh, Ian receives the opportunity to meet with his father on his 17th birthday. So in, in that way, you've got a bit of a sense of classic, classic fairy story, classic folklore. You know, on the morning of your 17th birthday, you shall be handed something. Yeah. You know, and you'll enter. And, and that does a huge amount for those who believe in... You know, this is just all coming of age and personal yeah. actualization because they then go, see, I told you it was about just turning into an adult. Yeah. And I think there's something in that. Well, clearly, as Christians, we have to have, and as Christian parents, we have to have a way of saying, what does it mean for our children to mature, right? 
Yeah. Do not exasperate your children, but bring them up, right? You're, we're, we're actually trying to help our children become the adults that they are meant to be. Yeah. And really, to become adults we want to spend time with. Yeah, yeah. Right? Isn't that a joyful... I mean, that we want to spend time with them as children and hold on to that. But, but part of popcorn parenting, just to bring it round, is about I want my kids to be people I have the best conversations with yeah. when they're adults. Yeah. And so this is a way of training them. Yeah. And also when they're kids, segue, very nice, thank you. Before we <laughs> before you have one further comment for spoilers, what what is that what is a helpful starter question once you've watched yeah. the movie other than what was your favorite bit? What bit yeah. did you like? What was your favorite character? Yeah. That's all good stuff, but is there yeah. one extra little nugget you could toss us? I think I would probably say, I mean, I should have said it before, The if there was someone you could spend 24 hours with, who would it be and what would you want to do with, do together? Hmm. And that, I think, will you can very naturally lead that on to a follow-up for that. What would you do if you could spend 24 hours with God? Hmm. Or, I mean, you could say with 24 Jesus. hours with, with Jesus. Yeah. And really, that will get all sorts of questions going. But aren't we spending time with Jesus all the time anyway? Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe we are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what does that look like? So, yeah, hopefully that would be a good yeah. a good way in. Cool. I do think that's the, the genius of the film. And Dan Scanlon, I think, you yeah. know, that's a brave thing to make a film about. I can't imagine what that would have been like for him to sort I'd of I imagine take he on. spent a lot of his time in the edit crying. I imagine he did, and yeah. um, I mean, he probably cried over Monsters University, but for okay. different reasons. <laughs> just, uh... <laughs> I've, I've not yet seen that, although I will do now. It's on Prime. I love Monsters Inc., but I didn't. Yeah, I've yeah. not yet seen yeah. Monsters University. So, thank you very much for listening. There's a spoiler to come, and we we're, the reason that we're just doing it is that you don't need to tune back in if you don't want to have the movie spoiled for you. Spoiler to come, but uh, in the meantime, thanks very much for listening. Thanks, Nate. Thank you, James. And we'll speak to you next time. Cheery bye. Cheery bye. And here comes the spoiler. Uh, Nate, spoil it. Okay, so right at the but end But you better of the have film... a pretty compelling theological reason to spoil it for us. Yes. So well, this is better you, be pretty profound. For you particularly. Yeah. Um, because you've not seen it. So yeah. I am spoiling it for you. Other it's people fine. can pause. Yeah. Maybe I'll just do this bit on my own. Yes, that's right. I'll take my headphones so out. We get to the end of the film and everything comes together and the sun is about to set, so the time will be up very soon. So the hours have turned into to minutes, which have turned into seconds. A great rock dragon has been formed, which is now threatening their ability to spend time with their dad. And Ian and his brother, Barley, have spent this quest together. Ian is standing there saying, I really want to meet dad. I never got to meet him. And Barley says, well, I'll go and fight the rock monster. Ian realises he's the only one who can really fight this rock dragon. And he he's realised just moments before that all the things he had on his checklist that he wanted to do with his dad, such as play catch, you know, have a laugh, all this sort of stuff, you go back through the movie. Okay, and he's done them. And he's done them all with his older brother. Ah. Uh... And so what he discovers in that moment is that my older brother has been effectively my father. So my my relationship that I was yearning for is one that I've sort of overlooked because it was in my brother. So essentially, this is Jesus at the the Last Supper. Yeah, he's told, "Show us the Father." And what does Jesus say? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So that as Christians, we we have our our heavenly Father from whom we're cut off by sin, but we also have an older brother who has revealed the Father to us. Mm. And so and one of the most glorious moments is in the, in the heart of the rock dragon is Ian the elf, okay, having just destroyed it. And he looks through this crack, and there he left his older brother to go and speak with his dad. So he never actually gets to meet his, his dad. He sees his older brother talking with his fully formed dad, and they share an embrace... And then whatever else happens, and it's sort of we lose the scene. Then, when the sun has finally set and his dad's disappeared, 
Barney comes to spend time with Ian. And he basically says to him, Dad wanted me to give you something. And he gives him the hug. Mm -hmm. And theologically, this is what we have to understand, that Jesus, our older brother, gives us what he receives from his father to be ours. So when we see the baptism, this is my son whom I love with him, I'm well pleased. We just watch as the, our older brother and our father are separate from us, doing their own thing, which kind of has nothing to do with us. But then because Christ is ours in the gospel, we are given everything that he's given. Mm. So the love of the father comes to us, not separate from Christ, as though we were children of Jesus outside of him, but in Christ so that's the real thing that just had me in absolute floods of tears. And, you know, Pixar, they make these things very well. The music's brilliant. The way that they show it is fantastic. But what was really getting me was, this is the gospel. Because my, my older brother has given me all that I need from my father. And so that's my security. So it is a massive spoiler. <laughs> so it's about as big a spoiler as you can get. Yeah. This is like you're already dead. Except you know, this is except in a way we 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 don't when it comes to stories, I don't think we mind spoilers as much because there are very few things that are genuinely surprising. Mm. And we live in the moment whereby, you know, we've already said on this on this episode about how I was thinking about my daughter's wedding and crying about it even before mm. it had happened and it's mm. still you know over a decade away probably mm. and so you know actually I think I'm spoilers it's it's how you feel in that moment isn't it mm. and in those favorite films that you go back to again and again you still feel the same way yeah you know seeing Gandalf yeah. let go and to say yeah, fly yeah. you fools yeah, yeah, yeah and all those sorts of moments you know really they get you every time actually yeah because they're not a magic trick where yeah. you didn't see that coming and it's a surprise yeah. it isn't it has that emotional resonance that that literally echoes into eternity yeah it? and that's that's the you catastrophe yeah uh, to use tolkien's phrase that's the joy which we're being sort of we're tapping into yeah. through the through the film anyway thank you for that uh, we've already said goodbye so we're not going to say it again okay there we are <laughs>